uh, things I wanted to, first of all, remind everybody of is that if you're not a, a stock market investor yet, uh, I want to encourage you to get involved. Um, right now, the stock market is actually doing some really interesting things. It's had a lot of ups and downs, um, a lot of chaos. Uh, that's the best way to describe it. Uh, you're seeing the market uh, today. The market is really interesting. Oh, thing. Sorry. Today, the market uh, plummeted. And uh, and then right after it plummeted, it it went right back up. And so it's been just kind of out of control and ridiculous lately. Uh, but the good thing about that, though, is that over time, just so you guys know, uh, when you see the market going crazy, don't panic. You don't panic. Uh, one of the uh, reasons black folks miss out on a lot of wealth built in America is because we're afraid of the stock market. Um, I wrote my dissertation on the stock market. So I'm an expert on the stock market, not just a financial advisor. Uh, I'm the person who trains financial advisor advisors. Um, uh, this is that's true. And uh, I can tell you as a person who trains financial advisors that historically over the last 100 years, when we look at the wealth gap in America, the gap between the rich and the poor, the gap between the haves and the have nots, the gap between the whites and the blacks. Uh, what we find is that uh, stock market investing is the number one factor that determines uh, where you end up in America. Uh, in fact, uh, it's very, very, there are very, very low odds. It's a very low, very, very low probability that you can ever end up um, uh, in the, the the class of the wealthy or ever become self-made wealthy if you don't uh, either invest in the stock market or <clears throat> start your own business. Those are the two things that uh, you want to look into. And then, of course, real estate. Um, I think stock market investing should be first because that's easiest. That's low hanging fruit. You can do that five dollars a day or less, five dollars a week, really. Uh, and then the next low hanging fruit is entrepreneurship. Uh, if you <clears throat> are trained to be a good entrepreneur, you have the ability to um, uh, you have the ability to take a business idea. And literally, I've seen people have no money behind a business and end up going on and doing really well. Uh, actually, um, attorney Nicole Compton, uh, who teaches blackmoney103.com in the Black Business School, she did a video, a, a lecture recently on how to start a business with no money. Uh, and so uh, there are ways to start businesses with no money. She started her law firm with a $500 credit card and she was a 15 year old single mom. And now she's a lawyer, MBA and, and uh, a business startup expert. Uh, have I heard of uh, my econ? No, I have not. Uh, so I'll have to go check that out. <clears throat> um, the uh, now the last area of real estate is a little bit a little bit tougher, but it's not impossible. Uh, the, if you go to theblackrealestateschool.com, where Andre Hatchett teaches, uh, you have experts there that can show you how to buy homes, even if you don't have good credit, even if you don't have a lot of money for a down payment, all that good stuff. So I want to encourage you to invest uh, and uh, and kind of dig into that. Now the other thing I want to mention is I want to say thank you to everybody who hosted me in Houston. Uh, a lot of you are in here now. If you're from Houston and you were there, raise your hand. If you're from Houston and you weren't there, raise your hand. If you're not from Houston and you just you just love black people, raise your hand. Uh, because uh, I, I can tell you this, uh, the people in Houston were extraordinary, remarkable. It was awesome. You guys are great. And uh, I was so inspired by uh, the trip to Houston uh, be, that we went uh, the next day and we went to negotiate uh, with someone who owns us, uh, who owns, uh, I think it's the West Oaks Mall. And, uh, they, you know, she, uh, she was a friend of mine and she said, hey, boys, we got this space in the West Oaks Mall. Uh, would you be interested in uh, doing a black business school location there? And I said, absolutely. Let's let's talk about it. So I went out there. I saw the space. I liked it. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're, we're going to I'm going to let you guys know how it goes. Uh, we're going to it looks very likely that we're going to lease a space in the West Oaks Mall and uh, we'll be able to have gathering. And the reason that gathering spots are important is because uh, this gives us the opportunity to talk to each other on a regular basis. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to network with people in your community on a regular basis. It gives you an opportunity to come together and buy the block. Uh, it gives you the opportunity to come together and form uh, investment clubs. It gives you a chance to come together and share your business ideas. Uh, it gives you a chance to come together and teach each other, you know, and all these things. So, um, and we, we, we went for this in Chicago and in Philadelphia, and uh, we got the space and everything was good, but we, we, you know, it's just money, money, raising money in the black community for something educational is tough. Uh, raising money in the black community for comedy or entertainment is a different story. Uh, the, the black business school is, uh, is sort of, you know, the, our biggest challenge is that, uh, you know, some of these things we have to do really cost a lot of money. And, uh, and the, now the good thing is that I could I could probably do more with ten thousand dollars than a lot of people could do with one hundred thousand. But uh, but, you know, it's, it's sort of like waiting for the right time. So Houston will likely be the first place that we go ahead and get set up. Uh, I wanted it to be Chicago or Philadelphia. And sometimes things just don't work out. But I told you guys, even when we had to sort of uh, take a step back, 
from the location in Philadelphia. I told you that I was going to do this in Houston, Philadelphia or Chicago. And uh, once we set up in Houston, we're going to then look and, and, and sort of see how the model works and then go to other cities. Because what we want to do is kind of have it like a church model, basically like economic churches. Uh, I believe the church model is very effective when it comes to giving structure in the black community that we don't have in other places. Uh, church is a good church, a good ethical church uh, is, is actually a, one of the great uh, economic opportunities that we have as a community to pool our resources. And there are churches that are doing that. Um, and so uh, the difference with this church is that uh, instead of it being the gospel coming from the Bible, our gospel is black economic empowerment. It's all about talking about the future, future generations, how we can build wealth, how we can overcome wealth gaps and all these other things through through uh, financial literacy, education, investing, pooling our resources, creating markets, all these things. Uh, the other thing, too, is that when we talk about the afterlife, it's a little bit different from what you might hear in church. In church, the afterlife is when you go to heaven and you have streets paved with gold and, and 72 virgins and all these other things that they promise you in heaven. We don't promise you virgins. We don't promise you streets paved with gold. What we actually promise you is we promise you that if you make investments now, if you do certain things now, if you make certain decisions now in your family, then the afterlife uh, will be a wonderful, wonderful thing for them, for the people you leave behind. Right. The afterlife is uh, guaranteed. We know this afterlife exists. The afterlife is when you're gone and people behind you are here uh, being affected by the choices you made or didn't make. So this is your time. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. You're not going to be young forever. You're going eventually you're going to do like your grandma and great grandma did and great great grandfather. And you're going to become old and eventually you're going to pass away. And so the, what's going to happen is that there's going to be an afterlife where people behind you are going to get left behind. And they're going to uh, be affected by what you do or what you don't do. So what I want you to do is I want you to think about that. Think about what legacy you want to leave. Think about how you want them to see you when you're gone. And think about, you know, what you want to do right now to make sure that legacy is solid. And you don't have to do much. You ain't got to sacrifice the farm. You ain't got to, you know, go through hell. All you got to do is just leave a couple nickels here and there. Make a couple moves, little tiny money moves. And, uh, and, and your family will be set for a very long time. They'll, you, they, literally with money. The number one variable that you need to grow money is not money itself. It's time. Uh, it's not expertise. It's time. Right. It's not big connections. It's time. So the fact so the fact is that your number one asset in your favor is time. So what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about uh, before I let you guys. Uh, uh, if you if you would like to come in and, uh, you know, talk or, you know, make a comment or something and you're inside the webinar. Uh, yeah, raise your hand. There's a little button where you can raise your hand and I'll look to see who's raised their hands and uh, and I can bring you in so you can ask questions. I see Nakia says, I ordered two of the Black Millionaires of Tomorrow workbooks. I love them. I'm pushing them to people I know to buy them. Yeah, the workbooks took us a long time to do. We're very, very proud of the workbooks. Um, we gathered some uh, Black financial experts, or not even financial experts, excuse me, these are Black educators from a variety of fields. And we said, we want to create financial workbooks based on the Black Millionaires of Tomorrow curriculum and we need these workbooks to fit certain grade bands uh, and we need them to cover certain categories, money, investing, uh, stock market investing, things like that. And, uh, and we, we want something for first to third graders. We want fourth through sixth graders. We want middle school and then we want high school. And so these workbooks were done. It took us a very long time to do these. Uh, they fit, you know, all the educational standards, all this other stuff that they have in the public school system, even though we don't recommend uh, keeping your kids in public schools if you can't. But we but as far as like standards of, of how a workbook should be done. Uh, we made sure these met those standards. And so if you'd like to uh, take a look at our financial workbooks for children, get them for your kids, feel free to go to financialworkbooks.com. That's financialworkbooks.com. Uh, also, we have flashcards. Uh, we have the financial flashcards, which are at financialflashcards.com. And also we have uh, black history flashcards, black economic history, and then black women's history and black history in general. If you want to take a look at that, go to melanatedflashcards.com. That's melanatedflashcards.com. So financialflashcards.com melanatedflashcards.com and financialworkbooks.com if you want to get some stuff for your kids for Christmas that'll help them uh, long term and you can you know it doesn't take much time to go through them uh, give them money offer them money money works for kids um, what I do is I just tell the kids look, I'll give you ten dollars if you go through all this stuff and show me that you know it you know uh, that, that goes a long way all right and that's a good preparation for life because in life smarter people make money smarter people get the money so why not prepare them for that now um, I don't see anything wrong with that all right so let let me uh, go in here and um, and kind of read something uh, from Poweronomics. You know, I love Dr. Claude Anderson. And uh, in today's conversation, I wanted to start with, uh, okay, my sister says, my daughter loves the flashcards. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, all right. So let me see here. The All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read from 
uh, Powernomics uh, by Dr. Claude Anderson. Uh, uh, the, a copy of the book, you can go to drboycebooks.com if you want a copy of this. That's drboycebooks.com. Uh, okay, so Dr. Claude Anderson talks about these categories of inappropriate behavior among Black people. And, uh, and you know, when I was reading this, I was thinking about, um, you know, a couple of things. First thing that was going through my mind all day long was I was thinking about um, all the Black people that end up apologizing for things, you know, like you see public figures kind of always apologizing, always apologizing. You know, I remember Kevin Hart said something that was defined as homophobic, and he said it years ago. So next thing you know, he's being asked to apologize again after he apologized the first time. Uh, then I saw Mark Lamar Hill, uh, you know, say something that uh, that the Jewish community didn't like. And so he's being forced to apologize. And, uh, it, you know, and he's apologized before for other things that white people didn't like. And and then I thought about, uh, and then uh, the Heisman Trophy winner, um, the guy from the play for Oklahoma, I can't remember his name, the quarterback, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, he they, they went back and found a tweet. They found a tweet from when he was 15 years old. And he was forced to apologize for this tweet he made when he was 15. And I said, why is this man apologizing for tweets he made when he was 15? We all said dumb things when we were 15. Oh, get out of here with that. And so it just made me think about the fact that so many black men are forced to apologize on a regular basis. It's like always apologize, apologize, apologize. It's almost like you have to apologize for being black. You know, it's almost like you have to apologize just for making uh, white folks uncomfortable. Uh, they can make you as uncomfortable as they want to make you. They can say whatever they want to you, about you, uh, towards you, disrespect you. They can pump out music every year uh, where they're calling you the N-word. Uh, disrespecting your community, promoting black genocide and incarceration. And uh, they don't apologize for anything. They don't apologize for nothing. So I said, why do we have so many black men that are always apologizing and white people don't really apologize to us for anything? They haven't even, think about this. I want you to process this, right? They haven't even apologized for slavery. I mean, have you seen uh, a collective apology, you know, from white America or from, you know, Congress even apologizing for slavery? No, they don't. They won't even apologize for something that they know that they did. Right. And uh, which was far worse than just, you know, tweeting about somebody. You know, you talk about raping, castrating and killing people, separating them from their families, all this stuff. So they won't apologize to you for anything. But yet you are forced to apologize on a regular basis. Well, that made me go back to think about uh, when I had my battle with Little Wayne. I wouldn't say it was a battle heads up with me and him. It was more like a situation where a group of us. We're concerned that he refused to apologize for um, disrespecting Emmett Till. He made a lyric uh, where he compared Emmett Till's face. He said he, he talked about how good he is at sex. And he says, after I get done having sex with a woman, her, her vagina looks like Emmett Till's face, which was incredibly inappropriate. And um, and, uh, you know, Jesse Jackson's people reached out to me to, to talk about it. And I, I did what I could. Uh, he didn't listen. He didn't apologize. Um, Stevie Wonder, uh, call, you know, called him out on that and said that that's not appropriate. He didn't apologize. And I said, you know, I thought about it. I said, well, what made him apologize? I, you know, and, and, and what made him apologize? The difference was eventually what we did is we, we undermined his uh, his money and his platform. We got his Mountain Dew deal cut. We got his Mountain Dew. Um, uh, Mountain Dew is going to sponsor his world tour. Mountain Dew cut the tour. Uh, and for various reasons, you can go Google it if you want to. Um, I'm not going to go into that. But the point is, in, in the end, of, at the end of the day, you know, power, power talks. Power is uh, is something that uh, is important to understand because power is what gives you freedom. It's what gives you freedom of speech. You know, um, a black man who doesn't have any power doesn't really have any freedom of speech. A black man who doesn't own his own you know platform uh, doesn't have freedom of speech. A black man or woman who does not um, have resources uh, does not have freedom of speech. So you know, at the end of the day. Um, you lose your freedom of speech, which means somebody can tell you what to say. They can force you to apologize even when you didn't do anything wrong because they control you. They have power over you. So that's why things like poweronomics actually matter. So the other thought that came through my mind was I was thinking about um, black people who uh, who say and do things that are detrimental to the black community or black people who just have an issue with other black people. And uh, this came to mind because I was in Houston uh, this week and uh, there was a young young man um, uh, that goes to Stanford University who uh, talked to me for a very long time. You know, he came to both sessions. We had two sessions in Houston and he came to both sessions, stayed the whole time, asked a million questions. And I just love it when, you know, when a kid at, at the age of 20 uh, understands the racial dynamics in America. A lot of people don't get this stuff until they're in their 30s and their 40s. By that time, it's kind of late. It's not too late, but for some people, it's too late. By that time, they've blown opportunities. They've made mistakes. They put themselves in a mousetrap. And um, and so this brother was 20 years old. 
Uh, he's a Stanford student. I just had so much respect for him. And uh, he, he admitted to me, he said, you know, I used to um, I used to think white people liked me. You know, I used to um, feel like we were all friends because I was a football star. All the white folks liked me. The girls liked me. Um, you know, uh, I got treated a certain way. And he said, uh, and then he went through a situation where uh, he claims he was falsely accused of sexual assault by a white woman. And uh, eventually, you know, everything was dropped and all that because there was no evidence. And and it kind of came out that she had some mental issues, mental health issues. And, uh, and he said, when that happened, he said, it really messed with my head because I suddenly saw people turn on me. I saw people treat me in a way that um, I'd never seen before. You know, I, I got abandoned. And, uh, and he also talked about, you know, being at Stanford, he said, you know, when I was at Stanford, he said, all, the whole uh, black student unions kind of run or the black student body is kind of run where uh, a lot of the, the leadership is from the LGBT community and they kind of bully us. You know, he said we were, I was trying to speak about what, how I felt as a black man to be falsely accused of sexual assault. And, uh, and all they told me was that, oh, you're a straight black male, you're an oppressor. Like the straight black male is now the oppressor. Uh, in the minds of some of these brainwashed students. And he said, you know, I, I didn't understand. He said, I thought that I'd be around intelligent black people that I could relate to. And he said, you know, that's not true. I said, yeah, I said, absolutely. I said, a lot of universities now, uh, white universities are pretty much brainwashing factories for black people. So black people that think that success means running up behind white folks and getting into their schools and, and following behind them, working for their corporations, they become brainwashed, they become Decepticons. And so they end up leaving school with this degree in their hand and they don't have the first damn clue about uh, how white supremacy really works. They don't have the first clue that actually they are soldiers. Some of them are soldiers for white supremacy. You know, they don't, uh, they do things like they run around saying Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, without even understanding the dynamics and realizing that actually Black Lives Matter was created by George Soros and sort of run by white liberals to elevate uh, the LGBT agenda. That's why most of the Black Lives Matter leaders are from the LGBT community, right? So the LGBT community's goal is to control and to oppress the black community by uh, by inserting the leadership that they want to see in place. Uh, that's no different from how the United States controls third world countries. They control third world countries by infiltrating those countries and putting leadership in place that supports the American agenda. They did that in Iran, uh, where they installed a leader for 25 years who abused the people and who did all these, this pro-American stuff that the people didn't really actually want. And, uh, and then when they finally got that leader out of there, they went in there and they, they went into the embassy and we're gonna kill all the Americans. Like they, they booted the Americans out of the country. And so I think for black people, we have to boot some of these people out of our community uh, because they're, they're really kind of shaking, reshaping the brains of our children. I, I saw this when I went to um, uh, speak at Cal State Long Beach, uh, who has a really strong black a group of black students. I don't even want to call it the Black Student Union. It's almost like an independent group because they do things other campuses don't do. They invite in people like, you know, Louis Farrakhan and myself and Tariq Nasheed and um, and I said, this is strange. How, how can this school bring in Louis Farrakhan? Uh, uh, you know, your, your oppressors are not going to be happy with you. And they weren't. They were very unhappy that they brought in Louis Farrakhan. So here you have Farrakhan, this man who's revealed in the black community, I mean, reviled or I don't know if reviled is the right word. Maybe it's the wrong word. Anyway, he's he's celebrated. How about that? Don't don't make fun of me because my vocabulary is jacked up. But he's 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 re, he's beloved in the black community. He's a he's a, an extraordinary leader, one of the realest guys out here in terms of black leadership. And uh, and here you have these white folks that literally act like you invited Satan into the school. Like you invited the absolute worst person that you have ever invited. They wanted to spank these Negroes. They literally and they got and what they did was they got the black LGBT students. They they you know were organized to come in to disrupt Farrakhan's speech. You know, uh, they were they were there to, what they did was they all came to the speech. I was there, I was watching this because I was speaking the, after Farrakhan and I watched what they did and they came in and they sat down and right when the minister was talking, they did their best to disrespect and disrupt the speech and get up and walk out of the speech, right? And, um, and, and it was interesting because uh, I remember thinking that's so interesting. These, you know, these young black people have, have been trained to turn against Black people who actually have their back. I said, because, uh, you know, people like Farrakhan were fighting for your, your family. They were fighting for your parents when these white people would have strung them up by their testicles and killed them. You know, they were fighting for your parents back when, you know, the, your parents couldn't even come to the school, you know, and, but yet you are here to disrespect this man for the hard work he's done for the community. Uh, and so ultimately, <clears throat> um, it, it really made me sort of rethink what's really happening on college campuses. I used to think 
for sure that going to college uh, was a good thing for black people. And I do, I still think there are some things you can benefit from, but sociopolitically, uh, it is a liability. Sociopolitically, uh, universities, white universities uh, pursue a white agenda. That's what they're there for. They're not there. They're not black universities. These are white universities that pursue a white agenda. And what they and what they effectively do is they bring your students in and they make them uncomfortable when they come in with a viewpoint that's different from what the university endorses. You don't believe me? Well, look at who they either invite to speak or who they disinvite. They don't invite authentic black leaders and black people that are respected in the community. They invite people, black people, either Negroes on TV or Negroes who support like the democratic and liberal agenda, right? So if you're black and you're talking about the Me Too movement, they wanna bring you in. If you're a Margaret Sanger soldier and a, and a feminist, uh, then you, you're gonna get brought in, right? But if you are somebody who is say in the black community truly building uh, institutions in, in black neighborhoods, or you're talking about you know r strong ideas in terms of what black people really need to do to overcome white support, supremacy, then they see that as too radical. So basically, uh, they kind of want, you know, almost like you get a house and you get pre-approved for a home or pre-approved for a car or pre-approved for a credit card. You know, you get that pre-approval notice. Well, what they want is they want pre-approved Negroes coming to their uh, institutions. If, you know, if you are a pre-approved Negro, then you will get invited into uh, a UCLA or a USC, right? Uh, it, and, and then you, you really see more of the evidence of this when you look at even this composition of the student bodies. A lot of the schools don't even admit uh, very many African-Americans, especially African-American males. Uh, they will admit, unless the, the African-American males maybe are, are, are gay or something like that. But UCLA, for example, is a very racist school where they admit lots of black males to play football but they don't admit black males just to be regular students. You know, so if you are an asset for them and you can make money for them, then they'll bring you in. But if you're not, then they don't want you there. So ultimately what happens is that a lot of these black kids go to these schools and they're just really turned against the community. They're, you know, and what happens is they're kind of like the little children who used to get, um, uh, when they wanted to control the Native Americans and they would go to the community and get the children out of the Native American community and they would say, oh, we're going to go and we're going to um, we're going to make your children better. We're going to help your community by making your children better. So they would take the children away and they would train them on how to be white. You know, and they would tell them, look, this is not how you get ahead in America. If you want to get ahead in America, don't be running right here speaking that language. Don't be running right here dressing in those, you know, in, in those cultural colors and all this other stuff. We need you to you, you dress like a white man. You speak like a white man. You do what white men do. And then what they would do is they would send these young children back to the community. Like they'd be their brains would be completely poisoned. Uh, and so they would send them back to the community and they would give them a government job and give them a high salary so they would look successful. And so the other children would see this and say, oh, I want to be like that. I don't want to be like, you know, Uncle Sitting Bull, who's who's sitting around here thinking that it's cool. You know, that being a, a real Native American is actually important or that or, or Uncle so-and-so who doesn't respect, who doesn't like white people. Uh, I want to be like this person over here who's able to, um, you know, adjust to modern times and who can integrate properly and all this other stuff. And so basically a lot of, you know, our kids that go off to these universities, they come back. Uh, believing that integration is the pathway to black success. Uh, they come back saying, look at me, look how successful I am, mom. I work for uh, Google and, and, and I just received a Pulitzer Prize or, or I just got recognized by you know, Time Magazine's 100 Most Successful Negroes or whatever, right? And, and these are the things that they bring to the community as symbols of success. But what's actually happening as well is that many of these individuals are, are deep in debt. They'll never be out of debt. So they'll never be an a financial asset to the community because they can't pay their student loans. So you're bringing, net, you're bringing negative net worth back to your community. Um, uh, secondly, you're not bringing any true skills that are actually gonna build the black community because you went to that white university. All they did was they taught you how to be white and how to work for white people. They never taught you how to actually be black and build your own business. They don't teach you how to build institutions in the community. They teach you how to fit into pre-existing institutions that are owned by white people. They've trained you to be a pre-approved Negro, right? They've shaped you up and, and, and sort of fit you up socially, politically, and economically to fit their agenda, right? Socially, you know the language, you know all the buzzwords, you, you know what words like toxic masculinity mean, which are pretty much words that they sort of invented, uh, you know, it just to kind of push their agenda. They don't understand that even white liberals have a long history of social engineering. The social engineering is sort of like, we're going to create terminology that helps us to alienate and ostracize those who disagree with us. So next thing you know, you're coming home and you're going to, to church with grandma. Grandma and you're telling grandma 
why she and her other church members are all homophobic because that's some shit you learn, you know, when you were up at, at UCLA, right? You're, you're bringing all, and then because in your mind, you think you're advancing the community. You think you're making black people uh, more modernized and less primitive and less behind. But really at the end of the day, what's gonna happen is that you're gonna find yourself 28, 29, 30 years old, wondering why as a black person, you can't get the opportunities that you deserve because nobody ever taught you how to create opportunities. You know, you might look down on your uncle Who's, who owns his little auto repair shop and who, who refuses to go work for anybody because he's running his own business, you might make fun of him, but guess what? He, he's got an asset that he owns that he can pass to his children. Uh, he might have a little bit more money in the bank than you. Um, and, uh, he's got a hell of a lot more job security than you. Uh, he's actually hiring <clears throat> and helping and employing other black people. And also he knows how to stay away from the white man and that viciousness that you experience when you're in corporate America trying to do the monkey dance, hoping that you can be a pre-approved Negro that gets to the top of the corporate ladder. You're trying to court, climb the corporate ladder. Uncle Willie that you're making fun of is building a corporate ladder. He is the corporate ladder. He controls the corporate ladder. You're trying to climb somebody else's corporate ladder. So ultimately, a lot of our uh, young people that go off to college um, are being you know, just severely brainwashed. So this student from Stanford was telling me that when he was there, he said the LGBT students were kind of, the black LGBT students were kind of running everything. And that when he tried to talk about his experience as a black man being falsely accused of sexual assault by a white woman, he said, they told him, well, well stop talking. You're talking too much. They have a term for it. I forgot what it is. I gotta, I gotta look it up. I, they have a term when, they're, when they shut you down and tell you, you can't talk anymore. And uh, and uh, so they told him he can't talk. They said, you're a straight black male. Uh, and somehow, literally in the last two or three years, they've concluded that straight black males are the oppressors of the black community. Uh, I think uh, was it uh, that site, Very Smart Brothers, which really is it's actually very gay brothers. Like it's pretty much, again, another move where they, they're sort of pushing the LGBT agenda. Not that there's anything wrong. If you're gay and you're here, I love you. I just want to make sure you're clear on that. But I, I also have to tell the truth. So that's where this is coming from. It's not coming from a place of hate. But anyway, they, they, they literally, uh, I think, wrote an article saying that straight black Black males are the white men of the black community, and uh, and and that that literally was some stuff that white people kind of came up with. They kind of concocted this nonsense. So he said um, he also said that when he went to his dorm, they told him um, that they, they told him that everybody in the dorm room has to put their name, their major, and their preferred gender pronouns on the door. They you know their name, their major, and their preferred gender pronouns. I guess like him or him or her or it or she, I, she, he, whatever. Okay. And, um, and he was like, I don't really want to do that. He said, I'm a, I'm a man. I'm, I'm, I, that's what I am. I, I don't need to, I'm not going to put, I don't need to put that on my door. And he said that he was told that if he did not do that, he would be sent to the Dean's office. He said that he would be punished. He told me that he would be punished if he did not put his preferred gender pronouns on the door. And, um, and so, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I think that there's there's a space to kind of talk about a little bit of everything, but what I really kind of see, uh, I, I, I'm, which is making me really skeptical of what's kind of happening in a lot of universities, is I really see um, an effort to kind of kidnap your blackness from your child, kidnap your child's blackness, to kind of take them and say, uh, we're going to shape these Negroes up and make them into what we want them to be, and um, you, you're not going to change it. It's going to keep happening. Um, you know, and uh, and I don't know what to do about that. But what I can say is you want to be mindful of this. Also, I think for any black student who who who, who is questioning all of this, um, I told him, I said, let me give you the whole background, the whole the big picture on what's really going on here so you can understand these things that frustrate you. So, you know, so I really love this kid because he was very perceptive and he was able to kind of see a lot of things at the age of 20 that I, th I don't think I would have been able to see. And at, as a as a man who's much older than him, I was able as a black man who loved him and wanted to mentor him. I said, here's what's really going on. Let me put the pieces of that puzzle in there for you so you can lock in on kind of what's really going on, what the dynamic is. The dynamic is brainwashing and social engineering. Uh, that's what that is. And this is why it looks the way it does. And so what I think black students have should do, in my opinion, is uh, if I'm sending my child to college, number one, um, I make sure my child learns how to start a business. Uh, these business schools, 
um, you know, and these universities don't teach you how to start businesses. They teach you how to work for businesses. So they don't teach you how to be a boss. They teach you how to be a worker bee. Um, and uh, and that's fine. Uh, that's OK to work for other people. If that's what you want to do. But working for white people is very dangerous for black people because white people treat you bad. You know, working for white people your whole life is very dangerous for black people because white people treat you bad. Uh, and that's as simple as I can say it. So white people can work for other white people and it's fine. You know, but when you tell me like, well, why well, can't I go just go get a job like my white friends can do? Well, because you ain't white. Like, I don't know who told you you were white. I don't know who told you like what integration policy made you believe that somehow you were going to magically wake up with blonde hair, blue eyes and, and, and be a white boy. You ain't white. You ain't white. And, and I think that's I mean, I think that's one of the biggest things that I think our young people just don't understand. They don't realize like they get out and they they graduate from college and they go to the corporate America and they don't get the same job as their white colleagues or they don't get the same pay. And they're like, my God, this is so unfair and this is racial bias and oh, blah, blah, black lives matter. And, and I'm like, who told you you were white? Who told you you did you know that you live in America? Did you know what country you know what country you live in? You don't live in you don't live in La La Land. You live in America. This is America. This is America, <laughs> you know. Like you know, and, and who told you? Who sent you the memo telling you that you were now white? You ain't white. So yes, it's gonna be like that, you know. And so ultimately, you know, what I really think is that if I were a black student nowadays, you know, I would get with other black students who understand this. You know, there are there are a band. There's a band of black people out here. Band of young black people. Not many. I don't. I don't really talk to a lot of college students. A lot of, most of the people that, that come and talk to me are people who are slightly past college and beyond, right? College students, you know, they're, they're sort of sucked into that space and that environment. But I got a few out there. I got a few out there that, that hear me. And if you hear me, here's what I need you to do. I need you to go and take a leadership role on your campus. Uh, tomorrow, I want you to go start an organization on your campus. Uh, you can call it the Black Student Union, the Black Student Society, the Black, the, the, the African-American uh, cultural uh, collective, whatever the hell you want to call it. I'm not going to cuss, but whatever you want to call it. And what I want you to do is I want you to make it an organization that is not sanctioned by your campus. You don't need those people to sanction anything that you do. You don't. And in fact, you know, yeah, I know you won't get, they won't give you any money to hold your events. Who cares? Who cares? I mean, do you really want to take money to be a pre-approved Negro anyway? You're not an asset to your community if you're a pre-approved Negro who's literally pursuing a white racist agenda uh, that, that has nothing to do with the people that uh, from the community from which you came. So my belief is that if you are a black college student and you're going to college, start an organization, uh, gather with other black folks who kind of get it, who think some of that stuff is stupid, who doesn't, who don't quite get what, what's going on and create your own organization, raise your money in your own way. You can sell T-shirts, you can do fundraisers, you can sell candy bars on campus, go buy you some candy bars for 30 cents a piece, sell them for a dollar, raise money that way, whatever it takes, you know, like just get away from that. Because the way they control you is they control you with the money and they control you with uh, the validation by saying that if you don't do things the way they want you to do it, you're not going to be accepted and they're not going to they're going to take away your good nigga sticker and all this other stuff. Um, let all that stuff go. Uh, because, what you know, what's happening right now in America is that most black college graduates are not doing anything to advance the cause of black people uh, because they're, they're pursuing this fake dream called integration that, do, that has not worked. Um, and uh, and the, the higher you climb up the ladder, the less effective you actually become in many cases. And so what I'm saying to people is walk away from the ladder and look to build your own ladder or look to build with other people so that you can actually have something that's truly, truly yours and, and true power. OK, so anyway, uh, uh, let me uh, mention this, too. Um, by the way, if you want to uh, join, if you want to learn about stock market investing, we still have our stock market class. If you haven't taken a look, you can go to theblackstockmarketprogram.com uh, for Christmas or for this month of December. There's a big discount, 75 percent. So go to theblackstockmarketprogram.com. Uh, and uh, also, I see uh, Alicia, Alicia Pottinger. Um, Alicia, did you, would you like to say something? If you'd like to say something, Alicia, I'm going to hit the button right now that's going to promote you to panelists. So let's see if I can get Alicia in here. And if Alicia comes in, I'm going to let her uh, speak her piece real quick. Alicia, can you hear me? Are you, are you here? Okay, let me hit this unmute button, see if I can unmute you. There we go. Hey, Alicia. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I met you. Did I meet you in uh, Houston? Yes, you did. 
I'm the one that asked about the the having the the group meeting. Oh yes, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. You you inspired me. You you were part of the reason I went and um, talked to that lady about signing that lease. No, uh, all right. Yeah, we're, we're gonna get it done now. So how do I help contribute? You know. Well, you know what? What we're gonna do with that space is we're going to actually send out a call for people that want to come in and uh, and and help us with the space. Um, uh, and uh, and we'll, we we just have to structure it in terms of exactly how we want it to look. What we're anticipating is that the space will have um, uh, basically uh, classes that people can take in the community, um, as well as uh, networking sessions where you can meet other people in the community to pull your money together and go buy property and things like that. And also, um, we find support groups help, too, in terms of people dealing with the stresses of racism and, and, and figuring out how to get off the corporate plantation. A lot of entrepreneurs have extreme anxiety because they're scared. They feel like they're doing it by themselves. Also, you got people that are still working for corporations that are going to work stressed out every day and very unhappy. So we're actually going to um, kind of conjoin all that together into kind of a space where all those things are going to happen. So we can actually use some help with that. Um, so are you are you signed up? Are you um, are you on our, our list? Are you signed up in the Black Business School? I was. Okay. What do you mean you was? You, you, didn't un, you didn't unsubscribe, did you? Well, I don't think that I unsubscribed, but I was taking the, the um, stock market class. And so I, I dropped off. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Well, even if you dropped out of the class, you can still be in the Black Business School without taking any classes, uh, oh. without, you know, where it's totally, it's totally free, uh, where we can at least be connected. And that's okay. the key. So if you're in there and you're connected, then that means that when I, I I reach out, you'll know you'll you'll hear from me when we reach out. Um, okay. That's that's the thing. Like remaining connected is really important uh, for Black people. Have you know having a good platform where we can talk to each other really matters. Uh, one yeah. of the ways that they um, shut down you know voices that they don't want to hear is they they take your platforms away. So we try to be able to reach out to Black folks in many ways as many ways as we possibly can. So uh, as long as you're connected and also if you haven't done that yet, you may want to get on the text list where I can text you. You know, if I go live, stuff like that, if you just text my name, Boyce, B-O-Y-C-E to 31996, uh, th that's 31996. Uh, you can actually get a text alert when I go live and that way I can get the message out. That's because because uh, I'm always thinking about like, OK, what if they, what if what if they block us here? What if they block us there? Mm -hmm. We want to have a million different ways. Uh, to be able to let people know what, what we're up to so that they can uh, be a part of it if they want to. Okay, good deal. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you. I'm excited. Yes, ma'am. It's so good to see you. And thank you for hanging out with us uh, in Houston. It, it was it was a pleasure interacting with you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Um, yeah, so if you live in Houston, we're going we're gonna to actually get that space started. Um, prior, I'm, I'm anticipating relatively quickly. Um uh, and in fact, if you live in other cities and you want us to consider getting a space, maybe you have a space or you know of a space that won't cost us an arm and a leg, uh, you know, email email my assistant. Her email address is assistant at voicewalkings.com, assistant with a T at voicewalkings.com. And uh, let us know, you know, say, hey, we got this space is 3000 square feet and we could lease it to you for a certain you know price, a fair price. And, you know, like like I said, I mean, we we like for we need the prices to be low so we can keep the prices low for the things that we do. Um, and, and because we want everybody to be able to have an opportunity to be, to participate in what we're doing. Um, and if you have it like that, you know, if you're doing well financially, um, then we would love your participation as well so that, you know, we can actually work together to achieve specific goals in the community. So um, I see Newark, New Jersey, I would consider Newark actually. Uh, okay. Downtown Newark near Rutgers. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Maxwell. So if you, uh, if you want to want us to take a look, uh, send uh, email assistant at voicewalkings.com. Maybe in the title, put something like um, uh, potential black business school location or something like that. And what we really want is we want to kind of have these centers, almost like the way Malcolm X used to set up these mosques all around the country where people could get together and worship. Um, I want to set uh, set up little spaces all around the world, actually, not just in the United States, uh, all around the world where people can get together and uh, do investment clubs and support each other and learn from each other and all kinds of stuff. So uh, that, that's the model. That's the goal. And uh, I'll keep you guys posted uh, as we move forward. What about Los Angeles? Oh, Los Angeles at the top of the list. We have a lot of support in Los Angeles. I love the people out there. So if you know of a space in L.A. Uh, where there's black folks nearby, 
uh, reach out to us, assistant at voicewalkers.com. And we will pay for the space. Uh, you don't have to give it to us for free. Give it to us for free would be nice. You know, but if you can't do that, then, um, you know, it just just charge the price that ain't going to break break the bank. And, uh, and, and, and maybe we can work something out. One good thing, too, I found we, we went to Denver and we um, we set up uh, we set up shop in Denver with Michi X and Vicky Dillard. And I, we all went down there together and we uh, got this guy named Brother Brother Jeff, who said who opened up his culture center for us to come in there for free. And uh, Brother Jeff didn't charge us anything. Uh, I appreciate that very much. We took a collection up for him. So Brother Jeff got some money from that or he took. Well, I, I, they took up the collection, but still, I was happy about that. And then also. Um, also, they have vendors set up, you know, vendors from the community. I don't know if they have their own vendors or not. I hope that they did. But here's the thing. Like, so if you have a space that's big enough to host, it has to be a decent sized space. Like in Houston, our challenge was the space that we had was a little too small. So, you know, it was jam packed. Uh, there's so many, you know, so many people came out. Um, but, it, you know, but if it's a decent sized space, it'll maybe hold 150 to 200 people. Um, then what can happen, what happens is that, you know, if you let us use that space for free, I can draw people in. And then you set up a, a vend, a, you know, a vending booth or two, and you can make a lot of your money back that way. So that's a good way that uh, that's how you can run an economy where I can say, OK, well, you're going to make sure we're going to make sure you get took care of. But uh, maybe we can do it in a way that doesn't require like a, a massive exchange of cash up front. Uh, so we you know, so we always take care of people that take care of us. So if you're interested in hosting us, feel free to uh, email assistant at voicewalkings.com. If it's like a town that doesn't have a lot of black people. Um, that's a little bit tougher. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it doesn't mean you can't try. It just means it's a little bit tougher. So if you in, you know, Anchorage, Alaska or something, you know, I might not be able to do that. I did go to Anchorage, actually, and speak at an NAACP meeting a few years ago. That's a long way. I'd take three airplanes to get there. All right. So let me see here. I see Brittany Sharp. OK, so Brittany, I'm going to promote you to panelists and see if Brittany wants to come in here. Um, so Miss Sharp, Brittany. Tell me if you can hear me. Wait. Hello. Oh, you don't look like a Britney husband. I mean, we, 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 you know, we, women are get, getting getting bigger and stronger every day. <laughs> you, don't, you don't look like a Britney, man. What's, what's going on, bro? <laughs> hey, I'm doing all right. What's your name? Patrick. Mm. Patrick Sharp. Okay. So Britney is Britney um, your wife, your sister, your daughter? My wife. Oh, okay. Okay. We'll give, give our regards to Mrs. Sharp. Okay. Thank um, you. Uh, we went to see you in Houston and the Saturday and um we've been very we've been trying to be proactive ever since with uh we're looking into real estate and um so we were wondering about we live in we we drove two and a half hours from Temple Texas which is about 30 minutes away from Colleen um so we were looking in as for to finding a mentor um to help with our real estate investing and just investing in general and building wealth and we were also looking to see what do you think about uh, wholesaling, mm. wholesaling houses, finding absentee houses and contracting and getting assignments. It just purchase our first home. Yeah, I think that though, first of all, congratulations on purchasing your first home. Uh, that's a really important move uh, to make that jump from, uh, you know, uh, to in, into the space of wealth builders. Remember, we always talk about the three pillars of wealth, stocks, real estate. And um, and business and entrepreneurship. So uh, that's a huge move for you because now that means every penny that you spend, or big not every penny, but most of the pennies you spend on housing will go back into your pocket, and it'll also be allowed in a position to make your money grow. Uh, that's that's one of the keys to building wealth. Um, uh, going deeper into real estate, I ask you to get a mentor. Uh, mentorship is important because a lot of people make big mistakes when they go into real estate. They get locked into deals that they don't want to be in. Uh, they get very confused. And that's why I think it's why a lot of people stay away from real estate because it comes off very confusing. Um, I would try this. Um, uh, Andre Hatchett runs the black real estate and I, and I don't think his programs cost that much money. And he's got a ton of real estate experts um, at the black real estate school that really, really know what they're talking about, you know? And, uh, and so what I would do is maybe sign up for one of his programs uh, and then when they're having the meetings and you, you ask questions, uh, email them and ask, you know, ask, you know, just find somebody that, that will be willing to mentor you. Um, I would actually pay for my mentor so you can really get your money's worth. Uh, we've got some real estate experts in the black business school too, uh, Dr. Venetia Dutra and some others. I don't know what Dr. Dutra's time is like, um, but, you know, I would definitely 
uh, find a mentor, but then also compensate the mentor so you can really get uh, get the best, you know, get get them to sort of prioritize you. You know, it's it's uh, hard to get mentorship without giving something to the mentor to make it kind of worth their time. So, um, you know, I, I, I but I think that's a good move. I, in fact, that's what I would do if you're really just getting into it for the first time. Um, and I think just even being in a program or a class yeah. where you're talking to other real estate people on a regular basis helps. Also, if there's something in your city um, going on with real estate, I would join that too. So you can learn about opportunities that are right there in your city. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And um, what do you think about wholesaling? Um, I think wholesaling is good. I mean, it's like anything else. It's like, it's like um, in football. If somebody says, "What do you think about the nickel defense or the West Coast offense?" Well, it depends. Okay. Uh, you know, how, how well do you run it? You know, <laughs> you can win games with it. You can yeah. lose games with it, right? Uh, and so, it, wholesaling is okay. the same thing. I've seen people that that win at it at wholesaling. I've seen people that lose at wholesaling, right? So, uh, okay. I, you know, if I'm going into wholesaling, first of all, I learn everything I can. I read everything I can get my hands on. And then I really talk to people that really know what's going on. Because there's only so much you can learn from a book. You know, uh, you know, again, think of, again, think of, I, I, I like, I guess I like sports analogies because I'm a former athlete. But it's like, if you, you know, if you play basketball or football, there's only so much you can learn in the locker room with X's and O's. And, and then even there's only, only so much you can learn from maybe scrimmaging. Right. Uh, you know, you know, and then maybe you play in some games so you can get some game time experience. And then maybe you you have a player if you have a player on your team that's won championships that can help, too. You see what I mean? Uh, yes. You know, like, like the Lakers are going to do better because LeBron is on the team because LeBron knows what it takes to get through the playoffs. So that goes far deeper than just the X's and O's. It's far deeper than just scrimmage. It's far deeper than just the fact that you played a lot of games. There's that next level of somebody that's actually won a championship. That 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 can fill in, the, tell you the little things you need to know that'll help you get there. So find some people that have won championships, and that's how you'll be able to win at wholesale. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, my brother. Have a good evening. You too. All right. Okay. So uh, speaking of championships, we're actually going to start uh, early January. We're going to start something called the Black Business Championships, uh, where we're actually going to allow you people to come in and do a two minute pitch of your business. You can do a two minute pitch of your business. It has to be less than a year old. And uh, we're gonna have judges that will judge your pitch. And uh, and we're gonna do it kind of like a tournament style scenario where we'll have four people come in and give a pitch. The audience can watch, the audience can vote, the judges will vote, and then uh, people will go to the next round. So the first round will have 16, then we'll have eight, then we'll have four, and then we'll have two, and then we'll have the champion. It'll take about a month to kind of get through everybody because we're gonna do it you know, like once a week. Uh, and so I'll let you guys know about that. Uh, if you want to uh, be eligible to uh, join the pitch competition, uh, join the Black Business School because that's where we're going to get uh, the people from that can make the pitch. Uh, so go join the Black Business School. You can join for free. You can do a free membership or you can take a class, whichever one you want to do. Uh, but we're going to grab our pitchies or our pitchers, if you want to call it, out of the Black Business School because uh, we want you to have some business training and kind of have be able to answer questions. Because we're going to answer ask you questions not just about how to pitch your business. Or we'll, we'll let you pitch your business. But then after that, the questions will be things like how will your business benefit the black community or tell us about your, your accounting system or explain to us uh, how you market and acquire a customer, you know, things like that. So the quality of the answers will determine if you go to the next round. Uh, the winner is going to receive, a, you know, a bunch of prizes, including like a lifetime all access pass to the Black Business School. Uh, you're worth thousands of dollars. Uh, we'll, we'll have some money that we can invest in the business, things like that. So uh, that's going to be kind of fun. Uh, it's just something fun that I thought we would do that will kind of make it that it sort of accentuate the excitement of uh, starting businesses. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you guys more about that as we get it set up. Um, Courtney says, good evening, Uncle. We appreciate your presence in Houston. Well, I appreciate it being there. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Nakia says, I have Black History cards also. Awesome. Thanks for all you do. Well, thank you. The Black History flashcards are at melanatedflashcards.com. That's melanatedflashcards.com. Uh, Nakia says, toxic masculinity is bullcrap. Um, you know, I think that there could be such a thing as toxic masculinity. You know, for example, if somebody's a uh, an abuser or a rapist, then that that's obviously toxic masculinity. That's really toxic behavior. That's masculinity out of control. But um, they're kind of getting to the point where they kind of think all masculinity is toxic. And ultimately, they're arguing that the black man himself is toxic. And, uh, and of course, I reject that. Um, I think that masculinity can be very beneficial to a community, just like femininity can be, you know, beneficial to a community. And if you go look up, um, you know, 
Black Lives Matter and you kind of look at their website, blacklivesmatter.com, if I'm not mistaken, I believe on blacklivesmatter.com, remember Black Lives Matter was not created by black people. Um, at blacklivesmatter.com, or maybe it's .org, here we go, black, let me look it up, blacklivesmatter.org. Um, one thing you'll notice, and I'm gonna see if they've changed it since then, uh, it says we, we're bringing together a uh, country from the world okay, that speaks to blacks in America. Wait, that's not, that's not it. Okay, Black Lives Matter. No, 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 no. They used to have a website, Black Lives Matter. Let me see if I can find the Black Lives Matter website. Okay, I guess it says blacklivesmatter.com, but here we go. Yeah, it is .com. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm looking here on the website, and I, if I'm not mistaken, when they sort of define the purpose of Black Lives Matter, oh, they changed this. They, they've changed this page a lot, so it's not what it used to be. But before when I went there, I remember they were saying that the um, that the website they, they mentioned, um, you know, uh, single moms, they mentioned uh, LGBT, uh, et cetera. But there was no mention of men, husbands or fathers. Here we go. We affirm the lives. Here's what it says on the Black Lives Matter site. It says we affirm the lives of black, queer and trans folks, disabled folks, undocumented folks, folks with records, women in all black lives along the gender spectrum. So you see that the language is very centered around the whole gender identity, LGBT kind of thing. And they even throw in other parts of the white liberal agenda, like the whole undocumented immigrant issue. And I'm not saying that these are bad people or that they shouldn't, they don't deserve support, but uh, what they're doing is they're kind of leveraging the black civil rights struggle uh, for their own purposes. And, uh, and you see sort of this conversation about um, you know, about these things that many black people don't identify with. You know, I know a lot of black people who aren't really uh, all that concerned about what's going on with undocumented immigrants. You know, uh, they, they, they see that as, as a secondary issue. But what they do is they kind of pull that in and make that into a primary kind of thing. And so, um, you know, with Black Lives Matter, uh, I think I, even I was fooled by that, but I, it, but it, I wasn't fooled for long. And then you go into, um, what is it? Oh, and even with feminism, uh, there's nobody who can really read the honest, his, honestly, like honestly and with an open mind, read the history of, you know, Margaret Sanger and her agenda of extermination for black people, things like that, and not sort of at least question it and kind of say, man, maybe maybe we're supporting the wrong thing or fighting for the wrong team. So um, anyway, let me uh, let's see. I see some more people in here that want to uh, come in. Let me uh, see if your hands are up. OK. Uh, OK, I see you all in here, but I, I'm not really sure. Who okay? If you if you if there's a button where you can raise your hand and you're inside the webinar, uh, please do that. Or if you have a question, just write your question in the Q and A section. Um, okay, somebody said wholesaling is really tough in Houston due to so much competition. I think that's true. But one of the benefits of being black is that um, you can go to neighborhoods that a lot of people may be overlooking. So I think that there are opportunities um, uh, out there. It, it, there. it may be competitive, absolutely, but I think there are still opportunities out there. Uh, there are so many websites. Can you please put them all on one page? Um, says Kubal. Okay, that's a good point. Um, yeah, um, I, I, I let me let me think about how I can set that up. Because uh, you're right, I don't I don't want to try to confuse everybody. Let me read something to you uh, from Dr. Claude Anderson's book, uh, Poweronomics, which I think is something every family should read. Um, I think you should get your if you want to get your family a great gift, your children a great gift, get them a Poweronomics and, and make them read it. I'll offer them twenty dollars or fifty dollars even. Just say I'll give you fifty bucks if you read this book. Because okay, this book is one of the most important books ever written in the history of this country. Uh, so here's one part where he talks about categories of inappropriate behavior. He says there are many types of inappropriate behavior ranging from the classic Sambo, uh, a black person who, who betrays their own race for personal profit, to a militant with an attitude of blacker than thou arrogance. Inappropriate behavior is the manifestation of the intentional softening of the competitive pulse of an individual or group to the point that everything is turned upside down and backwards. The individual or group is inclined to compete among themselves and ally with outsiders, form these outside alliances. We're always there. Everybody wants to form an alliance with the black community to get them to get black folks to support their agenda uh, rather than ally with members of their own group to compete against outsiders. So uh, the one of the reasons I, I gave you the warning about what they're doing to your college students or your kids when they send them to college is 
they're getting them to form alliances with all these outside groups and abandon the black community. So your child comes home and they're speaking more about feminism, LGBT and undocumented immigrants than they're actually talking about what's happening with black folks. Uh, and that's 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 why they end up becoming a liability to the community and a distraction to the community as opposed to an asset to the community. Not all of them, but many of them are um, because they, they've been led also to believe that these alliances and, and, and pseudo integration, uh, you know, poorly designed integration plans which strengthen white supremacy, they're led to believe that that is the key to prosperity for black people. So it's uh, like somebody it's like sending your your child to go hang out with a rapist and your child thinks that being friends with the rapist is uh, the best way to not get raped, right? If we are friends with the rapist and we support the rapist and we help the rapist pay his rent, then the rapist will not rape us anymore. And there are other people who say, no, we actually shouldn't even be around the rapist. Uh, and so white supremacy is the rapist. Uh, these institutions are white supremacist institutions. The black students at uh, Princeton actually were fighting against the university, uh, you know, fighting against Princeton over the fact that one of their uh, most prestigious uh, schools, I think the School of Public Policy, uh, is named after Woodrow Wilson, who was a really horrible white supremacist, who was a huge racist, hated black people, hated black people. So they're bringing you into an institution where you're being asked to honor and worship somebody who hated you, right? Like you're being told, you, you're denying and neglecting those who love you. Like, like if Louis Farrakhan wants to come speak at Princeton, they're not gonna let him in. They're gonna call him homophobic and anti-Semitic, they got a long list of adjectives that they use to describe men like Farrakhan. Uh, my only adjective for Far Farrakhan is strong, intelligent black man. But at Princeton, they're going to call him every name in the book because they're not even going to give him the right to even share his viewpoint because they don't want their Negroes to be tainted. They don't want their pre-approved Negroes to be poisoned. Right. So they won't even give Farrakhan the opportunity to come and even defend himself in that environment because they're going to label him in all these ways. But here's, here's what's fascinating. At the same time, they're exalting people who were known and proven racist. So think about this. You're rejecting people who love black folks, who are going in, into the hood, helping black folks build. The, the, the men and the women who are supporting single black mothers when everyone else has forgotten them. The men and the women who are helping black people to develop our own school systems and to uh, build a future for our community. They're rejecting those people, but they're asking these young black kids they're, they're, treat, they're teaching them to exalt white people who hated their guts, who would have lynched them on sight, right? There's something wrong with that. That's not normal. That's, that's abnormal behavior. That's the, the, the mental illness that comes with being black in America and not knowing who you are. So the individual group is inclined to compete amongst themselves and ally with outsiders rather than align themselves with members of their own group uh, to compete against outsiders. What is even more troublesome is that inappropriate behavior teaches whites and others how to treat black people. If black Americans want to change how they are treated, they must change what they are teaching their competitors. Below, we will briefly discuss a few of the most common and destructive categories of inappropriate behavior. First type of inappropriate behavior is what they call, he calls collusion with the competition. Collusion with the competition. This type of behavior is visible in coalition building. So when, when you got black folks, they go to, you know, go off to college and they say, we, 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 we're forming the, you know, the, the um, you know, the black and brown coalition or the black LGBT feminist undocumented immigrant coalition, um, you know, black people always end up at the bottom of the barrel. Black people don't understand why we consistently vote for the same politicians and always end up not getting anything out of the deal. <clears throat> and, um, and so he says coalition building is part of this inappropriate behavior because you're colluding with people <clears throat> who don't have your best interests at heart. Now, um, so you now to go deeper into that, uh, you know, let, let's kind of talk about this, right? Because I think that one of the problems is that the enemies of black people are not the people that the enemies that you see, they're the enemies that you think are your friends. You know, these are the, the enemies of black people are typically people that we think are our allies. So it is without a doubt the most troubling for the, the race because it is a strategy used by so many members of black America's leadership class. So the elite Negroes, the Negroes who went to Princeton and UCLA and all of so these other racist schools, uh, they guide you, they, they're leading you into the pits of hell. Uh, not only are they leading you into the pits of hell financially, again, they come out, how are you gonna tell me how to build economically 
when all you know how to do is go work for a white man and you're hundred thousand dollars in debt how are you really going to be leading anybody economically when all you know how to do is go fill out a job application and get mad because white people won't hire you you can't lead nobody economically how are you going to lead politically if all you can tell black people is keep voting for the same democrats say ignore them how are you going to do that how are you going to lead politically you wouldn't you remember you went to college you're, you're supposed to be smart and, and, and you can't you're not in, you're not capable of leading the only thing you can do is lead black people off a cliff or lead black people deeper into slavery you must learn independently or independent from these institutions if you're going to have the ability to truly lead black folks because the ability to lead black folks requires you to read from a book that is not yet written right the ability to lead black people requires you to rewrite the fucking curriculum you have to have the ability to go outside the box in order to know the freedom that exists outside the cage that you're born in. If you are mentally and physically inside white supremacist institutions, inside the box of white supremacy, then you can't lead black people to freedom because freedom does not live inside the box in which you live. Freedom does not exist inside that white supremacist box. Freedom does not exist with every black person trying to go work at Google and Xerox. Freedom does not exist with black people all going to Russia and get behind the Democratic Party every time they, they want to use us for our votes. Freedom does not exist for black people when you when you go $80,000 in debt to get a $50,000 a year job and, and are donating money in buckets to white supremacist institutions. Freedom does not exist when you go to college and, and play football so that you can get a chance to play in the NFL so they can use you up and spit you out and make you worthless. Right? That's not where freedom is. Freedom only exists. Freedom for black folks exists outside the box of white supremacy. The reason that you can't get ahead as a community is because many of your so-called leaders in your leadership class are people that live deep inside that box. I was on the plane today and flying to D.C. I'm going to be on the Rock Newman show tomorrow um, and uh, I'll let you guys know when, when, it, when it's released. And, um, and I was sitting in front of I looked back and I saw this uh, lady from the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, I don't remember which one it was. Um, I can't remember her name but I recognized her. And I, I, I did not say one word to her. I didn't say a word to her because I didn't see any value in, in what she's, I mean, she's, she's worked really hard. She's spun her wheels for years. She's got this important position, but I could not think of anything that she was doing or had done that benefits or elevates the black community on any level. So I had no respect for her at all. It wasn't that I hated her. I was just like, you're not doing anything new. You're not doing anything different from what a million other black people have done that did not work. That's not innovative, it's not interesting, it's not effective, it's not going to change a thing, right? So anyway, let me keep going. He says, although coalition building is a popular concept, coalitions almost always operate at the expense of black Americans. So the number one thing, the first thing you're, you're, that black college students learn, and I'm just talking about this issue because this is on my mind. The first thing black college students learn when they get to college is are, are concepts like intersectionality. Intersectionality is where they kind of mishmash everything together and kind of get you into this idea that if you're not a white male, that, you, that you're similar to everybody else who's not a white male. That being black is the same as being disabled. Being black is the same as being a white woman. Being black is the same as being gay. Being black is the same as being undocumented. And they kind of get you to buy into this coalition idea. And it, it happens at the expense of the black community. So, so what, what effectively occurs is that they're taking your smartest kids and they're making them into something that, um, that, that doesn't benefit black people. Now, somebody asked, how do I feel about HBCUs? A lot of HBCUs are kind of, they, they've got their unique flavor to them in the sense that um, I think that uh, black people get a different experience at an HBCU. It's a blacker experience. Is it a stronger, more effective uh, political experience? Well, it depends on who you ask and it depends on what you do. Um, it's blacker in ways that mean nothing. Like, for example, you know, you, you go there and you really learn how to put on an extraordinarily good step show. Um, there's nothing beneficial to the black community about you know thousands of our kids spending thousands of hours learning how to put on an, an effective step show unless you're a professional dancer right uh you know so i'm not you know so so little things like that like those parts of the black experience that's kind of safe negro behavior in the sense that yeah that those versions of blackness are not a threat to white supremacy they white folks will never be threatened if more negroes are learning how to dance white people will never care if more black people you know dress a certain way or or you know go to go to certain parties you know like like that like that's that's fun like they like that right and, and if you look and listen to a lot of people say in black hollywood when they talk about being black they can talk about that openly as long as they're not talking about being black and dangerous 
But if they talk about blackness, like they could, you could literally go speak at the Oscars and say, yeah, I grew up as a black kid and we used to watch Good Times and uh, and, and it had shoe, holes in our shoes and um, and used to eat soul food every day. And we all knew how to do the electric slide, right? You could say things like that and white people will laugh and clap and they think that's fine. They're not going to have an issue with that. Now, if you say being black means that I must also challenge America on the fact that black people are, are owed reparations for hundreds of years of slavery, oppression, Jim Crow, and mass incarceration, they ain't gonna clap for that shit. They're not going, they're, they're going to remove you from the stage because you're speaking inappropriately and you're speaking out of turn at that point. If you say that being black means that we need to challenge the Democratic Party for not doing what it promises to for the black community and, and, and manipulating the black community and to getting our votes and giving nothing in return, that's not acceptable Negro behavior, right? If you say that being black means challenging a lot of our allies, like telling the LGBT community, like, yo, look, we support you, we're good with you, but slow your roll. Don't tell us what we're supposed to do up in church. Don't tell us what we are supposed to believe. We will make that decision. If you if you say blackness means standing your ground against those who are trying to control how you think. Well, that becomes very dangerous, too. So that's the difference between um, a Boyce Watkins speaking on campus versus, uh, I don't know, the, the head of Black Lives Matter speaking on that campus or or a black person in corporate America speaking on that campus or a black actor speaking on that campus. We can both talk about being black and discussions about being about blackness are cool as long as they are either um, ineffective uh, or in support of pre-existing white supremacist systems. So if I come in as a black man who says, um, I wanna come there and encourage black kids to work hard and rise up the corporate ladder, you know, come to go to UCLA like me and then go get a job at Google and you can rise up to become a vice president at Google just like me. I, there's not, that's cool. There's nothing threatening about that. You're aligning black soldiers to support these white supremacist institutions. But if I come in and I say to black people, America's racist, get out, go build your own businesses, start your own institutions, forget these schools, you can build your own schools, um, you know, educate your own, buy black, support what's in the black community, come back to the hood. Well, that that type of language is not so much um, the language that's gonna make people comfortable. The allies don't really wanna hear that you don't need them in order to be successful. All right, so anyway, let me keep going. So he says, even though blacks themselves are not organized and do not have stated goal, stated group goals, coalition building encourages them to coalesce with other groups that do have articulated goals. Rather than to organize their own group, black participation gives credibility and strength to ethnic, class, gender, disabled, and Spanish-speaking power and openly oppose, uh, sorry, sorry, Spanish-speaking Spanish -speaking groups, I said Spanish-speaking power, sorry, Spanish-speaking groups, some of whom open, compete openly with blacks for wealth and power and openly oppose black gains. So Again, it's okay to be black in America as long as you keep your shit in a box, right? It's okay to be black in America as long as you keep everything in a position where it's non-threatening or non-consequential to the pre-existing power structure in America, right? It's okay to be black in this country and to talk openly about blackness as long as your blackness is limited to discussions about soul food and, and dancing and sports and everything else, right? But when you really start talking about power, then you kind of make people nervous, right? Uh, so anyway, let me keep going. Uh, when Blacks participate in coalitions, they allow the, the unique status, history, and debt owed to Blacks to spread to all the subgroups. Race is made synonymous with minority and racism synonymous with any form of discrimination. So a lot of universities like University of Kentucky, where I attend to school, um, they, they, get, they, they used to have, you know, like Black student unions and Black student organizations now they, they sort of said, okay, this has to be a minority student group. So now anybody who's not a white male can be allowed into that group. Now, on one hand, the first reaction that I had back then when I was younger was I would complain about that. And I'd say, no, we need our own space. We need our own space. But then I learned as I got, when I became a grown ass man, I realized, wait a minute, who's paying for this space? They're paying for this space. So because they're paying for this space, it's their right to decide who's going to be in that space. So what black people must do is that if you want to have your own space, you must pay for your own space. That's why I've mentioned, I've said this, if you're a black student and you're in college or going to college, create an organization and fund it yourself and say, we're going to go off campus and we're going to have our own space and we're going to do whatever the hell we want. Uh, so, so remember, somebody paying your bills isn't always a good thing, especially if the person paying your bills is your oppressor. 
It's like, uh, would you want your daughter to have her bills paid by a child molester? No, you wouldn't, right? So um, anyway, let me keep going. Uh, he says, uh, these, these are gigantic distortions and, of reality and give fictional common ground for building coalitions between blacks and any group that perceives itself as aggrieved. So anybody who's complaining can now say, we're just like the black people. Uh, and and at all the while, you've never had a serious conversation in this country about the reparations that are owed to you, because now you got a whole bunch of groups in front of you in line. Blacks should not be against any group. But what political or economic benefits do they derive from coalitions with Asians, American Indians, Hispanics, women, or gays that take Black problems, convert them into minority problems, and then propose a non-specific universal solution? Political coalitions created under the broad, ambiguous concepts of minorities, cultural diversity, and multiculturalism do not benefit Blacks as a group. In collusion with the competition, coalitions give Black Americans a trickle-down political experience. Trickle-down, trickle-down economics. Trickle-down means that it's like what Obama said. You get watered-down presidents like Barack Obama who tell you that, uh, look, the rising tide will lift all boats. And what they're kind of saying is, look, if we go and we just say, we're going to help everybody who's not a white man, Black people are going to be helped too. And what is not discussed in these coalitions is the fact that Black people uh, are a unique pariah. You know, we are, there's a stigma that comes with being Black that doesn't exist for other groups. Also, there's a history that Black people still have yet to overcome that doesn't exist for other groups. Uh, and so uh, ultimately, we're kind of like oil and water with the rest of the world. You know, I was talking to a friend who said, you know, boys, um, I know some donors and, 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 and foundations that I think will support what you're doing. Like you're educating, you're, you're giving financial literacy to millions of Black people. And the, I know donors who've got millions of dollars who would, who would fund that. And I said, don't waste your time. I said, don't waste your time because... Um, if we have one conversation, they're going to be offended by the fact that I don't fit their perception of the downtrodden, broken Negro who needs white people to save us, right? I, I'm not, I'm not that guy. I'm, I have more education than they do. Um, I have more power than many of them do. Um, I believe in an investment. Uh, I don't believe in charity or when it comes to black people. I don't think that that's what we need. Uh, I have a I have an agenda that says, leave us alone. We're going to do this on our own. Uh, I'm not going to let you sit back as the, as the big, powerful white man and take credit for saving the whole black community. Um, I'm the guy who says that black people can save ourselves. I'm also the guy who has no problem giving the middle finger to the Democratic Party and really saying that this is a ship that black people are building. This is a ship that black people are driving there this that's all that that's all that there is so effectively my point in that and the reason it never goes well when we have these conversations is that i know sitting down at the meeting i'm sitting there thinking if you are a regular white person at some point i'm going to probably say something that's going to offend you and you have a right to be offended because if you just gave me a million dollars to pursue my agenda and i still tell you to sit outside in the lobby while black folks are meeting and you're not invited to this party you're not a member of the family you're not one of us you're not we don't need your opinion right now um you know or it, it will be taken under advisement but you're not driving this ship who the hell wants to give money to that i don't know if i could i don't think i could give money away and then give the power away See, people will give the money as long as they maintain the power that's consistent with the money. That's a, a concept of investing that you must understand. Uh, think about this. Would you give a bunch of your money to someone who tells you that I thank you very much, but I'm not going to give you any say in how this money is used? Hell no. Right? You wouldn't do that. So I don't even blame them. I'm not even mad. I'm not a I'm not sitting here saying, oh, my God, that's so racist. That's they won't. The Ford Foundation won't give money to people like us and we're doing such good work. No, I just un I understand. I'm like, yeah, if I were you, I wouldn't give money to me either. You know, and so ultimately, uh, you know, all these way the ways I get approached about even what we do with financial literacy are very consistent with the way white supremacy works, the way white paternalism kind of works. It's sort of like, oh, look at you. You that you're such a credit to your race. You're getting black people to invest and getting black people to start businesses. That's so noble of you helping these, you know, weak, pathetic, ignorant, downtrodden people. You know, I want to help, too. This is a great charitable cause. Well, we're not a charity, motherfucker. Like, that's not how we are. Excuse my French. I'm like, I'm not no charity. We are an empire, baby. That's what we are. We are... We are the phoenix rising from the ashes. You know, this is Wakanda 2.0, except this Wakanda is 100% real. This ain't no Disney movie, goddammit. So excuse my French. I'm sorry. I, I, this is how I, I this is, what, I'm getting emotional about this because it's kind of like, like, no, like this ain't, this ain't, don't even, don't, don't you dare 
support me because I'm going to, we're going to dominate you. We're coming for what you got. We're coming to compete with you, right? So don't give us any points on the scoreboard because our children are going to outscore your children and we're going to be the ones who have to decide if we're going to oppress you or not in a couple of generations. I don't believe in that. We're not, I'm not going to tell anybody to do that, but just understand it would not make any logical sense for you to really even support this because this was not built to fit within the right white supremacist box that you're used to thinking out of. So, so basically, I think that we have to make a power move. I, I think Black people have to be committed to true power moves. And the thing about power moves is that power moves are not comfortable. Like power moves don't receive like the same kind of charitable support, will support that you might have gotten maybe during the civil rights movement, where people would feel sorry for you and they say, "Oh, those poor people are getting their heads bashed in. Let's help them." I think that's fine. I mean, if that's the game you're playing, but that's not a good game to play because you're playing to tie. You're trying to tie. I believe in playing the game to win. I, you know, that's why I reference the Jewish community. I don't reference the Jewish community in an anti-Semitic way, uh, in a way where it's like, "Oh, the Jews are bad," and this is. I reference the Jewish community as a prototype for Black America 2.0 and Black people 100 years from now. I reference that to say, okay, look, look at, here's what they're doing. Here's, here's how they're running their offense. They are training their children on economics at an early age, and they're also creating communities and cultures that allow for uh, various forms of economic connection and development. Uh, they're doing things where they're creating markets and industries within their own community that allow them to insulate themselves so that they then, as a small group, uh, a small part of the country, have a huge amount of influence, uh, mainly through the three pillars of wealth. I point out the Jewish community to kind of say, okay, let's pay attention. Let's do this. I point out the Chinese uh, the same way to say, look at the Chinese. They are they are some selfish bastards as, as a country. China does not care nothing about you or your country. Uh, the whole world went to go trade with China. The whole world was like, ooh, China's opening up, y'all. We're going to go in here and form a coalition with China. We're going to form an economic coalition with China. We're going to do them just like we do black folks. We're going to form a coalition and we're going to milk them dry. We're going to do them just like Africa. We're going to suck all the resources out and give them nothing in return. And what they didn't understand was China was not the little handicapped kid looking for a handout. China was making power moves. China said, yeah, we form coalition with you. Yeah, absolutely. welcome. Have some tea. And they sit down and they made deals where 30 years later, the whole world was like, damn, like we formed a coalition with China and China just sucked the life out of our economies. You know, there are jobs that used to be in Detroit that are now in Shanghai. You know, there are uh, there are resources that used to be controlled in Africa by either Africans or Europeans that are now being controlled by the Chinese. Uh, there are places in South America. Uh, there are towns, there are, you know, roads and, and, and all kinds of infrastructure in South America that's controlled by the Chinese because the Chinese understood poweronomics. They understood how you make deals uh, in a way that gives you power as opposed to making partnerships that take away your power, right? Uh, it's, it's like a marriage. You know, if you get married, marriage can be either beneficial to the husband or beneficial to the wife or beneficial to both, right? But a lot of marriages are off balance. You know, the husband gains more than the wife. The wife gains more than the husband, right? And so ultimately with, with these with these economic marriages, uh, you have to kind of decide what your, what your goal and what your agenda is. So anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, and by the way, um, if you haven't uh, if you haven't looked at our stock market program, feel free to check it out. Um, I mentioned it earlier. It's the black stock market program dot com. That's the black stock market program dot com. So write that down if it's a place you want to um, if you want to uh, learn how to invest or give that as a gift to one of your relatives. It's totally up to you. I think you'll love it. And you can get a degree from the black business school. So we actually people people always ask us, is the black business school accredited? And I say, I don't know. I say, no, we're not because I don't want to be accredited. Um, I want to give accreditations. So we don't believe in us, you know, trying to fit into a system. We create systems. Uh, we want to be an institution. We want um, global uh, access and connections that allow us to develop infrastructure all around the world that will allow black people to kind of step out of what's already there into something that's our own. And all we have to do, um, I thought about this in Houston. I think about it in every city I go to. All you need is people. All you need is are people that are kind of on the same page. So like in Houston, um, I was explaining to everybody, we had about a hundred and something people in the room. I don't remember how many exactly, but but there's a lot of people there. 
And I said, look, if all of you got together and just understood the basics of playing the economic game, then you can actually form an economy amongst yourselves because economies kind of form, they come from the three C's, uh, cap, the market for capital, the market for contractors and the market for customers. If you can help each other get capital, contractors and customers, you can do pretty much anything you want. You can buy buildings, you can start businesses, you can employ each other, you can do all kinds of things. You can help each other raise money, you can do all kinds, help each other get customers, you can be you can be customers for other people, you can produce products for other people. You know, that's, how it, it, that's how economies work. Economies are, are no different from love. You know, uh, if you have a, a, a thousand girls and a thousand boys and you put them in a room, then they can create families out of that 2000 people. Right. You don't need to go and mate with people outside of that room. You can actually mate with people in the room, find your next wife or your next husband in that room and do beautiful things together. Right. So ultimately, the number one thing that has to happen in the 21st century for black people to form our own economies is we have to come together. Uh, so um, with the black community, with the black business school, with our economic churches, if you want to call them that, um, that's the goal is to bring people together. It's to make sure everybody's trained on the game. Remember, again, it just like mating and dating. If I bring a bunch of boys and a bunch of girls together, uh, the debutante ball is maybe it is an example where you might bring the girls together with the boys. But what happens before a debutante ball? Well, the boys and the girls get training. If I'm not mistaken, they sit them down and they explain to the young ladies like, OK, this is you know, this is how you conduct yourself, you know, in, in the presence of a young man. This is what this is how you treat him. This is how you uh, make sure he respects you. Same thing is true with the men. You teach the men how to be men. Right. Because you don't want no thugs up in there dating your debutante daughter and you don't want no ratchet, you know, no, no hood rat chick dating your, your, your son. Right. <laughs> you don't want that. Right. So you prepare your children uh, for that in, engagement process so that it becomes a healthy experience. You know, you make sure your son isn't thinking that it's okay to grab a woman or rape her or something ridiculous like that, right? Well, the same thing is true with um, forming economic coalitions. You you train people in advance to know how to engage one another. You, you train the producers on how to engage with the consumers. You know, this is how you create a quality product. This is how you offer uh, a good service. This is how you, uh, you, you, you conduct your sales process in an ethical way. And then you train the consumers. Like, this is how you buy black. This is how you support a black business. This is how you deal with conflict with a black business without cussing them out and going off on them or trying to destroy the business, right? Again, debutante ball. The boys are trained on how to deal with the girls. Girls are trained on how to deal with the boys. And then you have you have magic come together, right? Well, you know, why do these debutante balls happen? Well, it's because you've got the children of these elite people in the community who are like, we want our kids together. We want them all in the same space. So they're not blending in with 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 all these other people out here in the world that we don't want in our space. Well, I think the same thing is true with black people. I think that we are economic and, and political and, and socioeconomic, sociopolitical royalty. So uh, I want black people to be trained on how to come together in a special space where they can engage with other black people so that we can keep things, you know, circulate our dollars, uh, keep or circulate our resources, circulate our talent and not export our talent out to the world. Because one, one of the things, one of the reasons China was losing for such a long time is because China was, um, was sending its best resources to other countries. They they had their best scientists going to America and you know their best business people doing business in you know in Europe and all this other stuff. And they were like, no, we want our people right here at home. So they had to develop a process for that. Let me read a little bit more. I'm reading for Poweronomics, page 27. Social etiquette. Behavior patterns in this category appear to stem directly from the old social or southern racial etiquette. He's talking about inappropriate behavior from black people. Though one of the major accomplishments of the Black Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s was to modify some of the social etiquette that traditionally existed between Blacks and whites, many Blacks across America, especially in the South and Midwest, continue to honor old social customs. They avoid situations that make them appear free, independent, and active in shaping their own lives. So everybody is sort of scared to be seen as too radical. I think that's what he's saying. They are perfectly happy to go to work or to church, look at television, and then go to bed. Uh, they 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 uh, they still know their place and know how to play glit low, get low to them. What happens to black people locally or anywhere else is of little concern. They want you to appear as good Negroes. Remember, I told you guys about the good nigga sticker, uh, content, happy, compromising and non-competitive. A good Negro or a safe black person seeks approval of whites. These blacks will neither speak up nor speak out on black issues, nor will they defend against black injustice. So. 
ultimately one of the things that black people have become very good at is uh survival uh not thriving but just surviving you know being in the middle of a horrible situation and just finding a way to make a way we're real good at that and as a result of this what he's saying is that you know part of that pathway to learning how to just survive in the midst of chaos and white supremacy and dysfunction is just kind of sitting there and knowing how to shut up and mind your own business you know uh not upsetting white people not being seen as the radical Negro, and we will actually ostracize the radical Negro. Um, when I was at Syracuse University and I started speaking up on racial injustice, um, I was really ostracized by other black scholars. This was before Trayvon Martin, this was before Black Lives Matter, and well, not that I, not that that's even a good reference point, but it was before black people started trying to be conscious. Um, you know, at that time, there was nothing cool about being conscious. And, um, and I remember, you know, a lot of these people, even though they agreed with me, and agreed that what I was saying was true, they uh, they would distance themselves from me because they didn't wanna be seen as somebody who was aligned with this radical, crazy black person. I had a black woman that I worked with literally tell me that she told me this. She said, um, I said, it seems like you're you're avoiding me. And I, 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 I assume that's not true, but I just wanted to you know talk about it. And she said, yeah, I am avoiding you because I don't wanna be seen as the black person who's only hanging around other black people. So, so you do have that. Now, here's now this leads to the next point. He says uh, the other form of inappropriate behavior, avoiding blackness. Blacks who exhibit this behavior avoid association with any form of blackness. They want to be the first or the only black person in an integrated company, school, neighborhood, organization or political party. Like whites, many blacks gauge the amount of black presence and anything that is not integrated or is all black as too black and too politically incorrect. Uh, this phenomenon is peculiar to blacks. There is no similar expression that someone or something is too Jewish, too Indian, too white, or too Asian. Avoiding blackness allows many to live in a state of denial until the reality roosters come home. So a lot of black folks like this black kid I met from Stanford, who I really respect. I love this kid. I, if you're here, man, um, please say something so I know that you're here. Um, and uh, one of the things that he said was, and it wasn't his fault, he said that you know when I was a football star, um, I had a lot of white friends. And he said, you know, I didn't want to be around people that were too black. I didn't want to be around blackness like that because I felt like racism was a thing of the past. He said, I felt like racism was a figment of my grandma's imagination. He said, I thought racism was over. And uh, when he realized racism had not gone away was when he was falsely accused of rape by a white woman and saw how his white friends reacted. Uh, a lot of his white friends who were really close to him you know, who really seemed to have his back, uh, basically concluded that he was guilty without even looking at the evidence. Now, here's the thing, you know, people rape, you know, rape, rape happens and, and you shouldn't be cool with a rapist. But what is not cool is to assume somebody's a rapist just because they're accused. Uh, but the thing is that, you know, if you look at America's history uh, for a black man, an accusation has always been as bad as a conviction. Uh, for a black man, when you are accused of a crime, you are seen as the person who committed that crime. Uh, and that's not just from white people, that comes from black people too. Lots of black people see black, the black man as a criminal. That's why you've got you know, uh, fake black news websites like, uh, what is it, uh, like The Root, you know, that will literally write about straight black men as if you know, they're the scum of the earth. And, uh, and again, this comes from the you know, black people who uh, pursue the white supremacist agenda and do all they can to kind of fulfill these stereotypes. It's a mental illness. So anyway, let me keep going. A true story illustrates how Blacks try to avoid Blackness. A woman who had grown up in a conservative Midwestern town was proud of the respect that and status whites accorded her family. She was proud that she and her children were economically better off than most Blacks in town and her husband was well known in white political circles. However, her world came tumbling down one day when she was in the grocery store with her young daughter. When leaving the store, they came face to face with a white mother and daughter. The young white child pulled on her mother's dress and said, look, mommy, there's some niggers. The white mother pulled the little girl close and whispered, hush, honey, those are the those are Wilson niggers. The friend who related the story was the young black daughter. She said that for the first time in her life, she knew that regardless of her family's economic status or prominence, she was not allowed to escape her skin color. While blacks do not mind being identified with a particular sports team or political party, many reject being identified with the skin color team that God has assigned them. Avoiding blackness is counter to the way out the way um, out groups respond. They exhibit an increased sense of group consciousness and close their ranks. They create associations, organizations, and businesses dedicated to whatever characteristic others dislike. For instance, Jews 
If Jews are persecuted because of their religion, they protect and strengthen themselves by building Jewish businesses, organizations, and tight-knit communities. They build Jewish synagogues that teach Jewish culture, history, and religion. They help build and support the Jewish state of Israel. Women who feel marginalized by the system because of their gender, gender respond because of their gender respond by building women's organizations and businesses to promote women's issues. The gay community builds gay organizations, businesses, and tight knit communities. Asians respond to this type of adversity by building businesses, organizations, and tight knit communities around their Asian culture. When whites say they despise black people, blacks adopt the same attitude. They imitate whites and run from blackness which should serve as a rallying point around which to build their defenses. When blacks run away from themselves and avoid their own skin color, heritage, history, and other members of their race, they become vulnerable and defenseless. They cannot protect themselves. So uh, basically, um, you know, a lot of our young black people are trained at an early age that the number one thing you can do to be a successful black person is to get away from other black people. You are taught that uh, the closer you get uh, to white folks, the better off you are. Um, you're, you're taught to, you know, get admitted to their universities, to uh, get access to their media outlets, to get access to their corporations, and to live in their neighborhoods, right? You're, you're kind of taught that um, that sort of getting away from other Black people is a way to properly integrate. And if you're too close to other Black people too much, there are people that actually criticize that. You know, you have Black people that say, well, it's not realistic to be around Black people all the time. You got to get used to dealing with everybody. And that's true to a point. But um, I think that we take it to the extreme. And I don't think we realize how vulnerable we become. Because, And if you don't see it, I mean, think about how Black people talk when they're sort of like you're the only Black manager in your department, right? Uh, you know, and they talk about how they're treated and what it's like. And 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 we kind of fight through it and we kind of are proud. Like, look, I fought through all this racism and look at me. Now I'm, you know, the vice president. Um, and I think that what he's saying in the in Poweronomics, Dr. Claude Anderson, he's saying that that's not the way it's supposed to be. He's saying that's not the way it's supposed to be. Um, let me uh, remind you guys, uh, if you want to check out our workbooks for children, uh, feel free to go to financialworkbooks.com. That's financialworkbooks.com or our flashcards at financialflashcards.com. So um, I want to remind you guys of that. Also, um, uh, we're going to pretty soon go to London, I think in May. So if you live in London, uh, we're going to uh, take a trip out there again. I love Black London. I think the people out there were great. And I think May is when we're going to head out to London. So I uh, just want to kind of give you the heads up on that. Um, another thing he says, he talks about, is are people that believe white ice is colder. Another category of inappropriate behavior is the persistent belief that white ice is colder. Black America is conditioned by family, school, and all the social institutions to believe that whites are inherently superior. Although there have always been Blacks who tried to disabuse other Blacks of this belief, their efforts have, have had limited effect. The superiority quality of the white man's ice remains a commonly accepted belief and expression in Black America. I am a witness. In the mid-1970s, I actually saw a real-life display of this inappropriate mindset and behavior. Standing with a friend in front of his office building in Tallahassee, Florida, I saw a black man drive up to a black-owned grocery store. He got out of the car and walked over to the ice machine. He picked up several bags of ice, examined them, put them back in the ice machine, and then walked across to a white-owned liquor store. There he went to the ice machine and took out two bags of ice. He examined them, then went to the drive through window to pay for them. My friend and I were so struck by the behavior, we asked him why he rejected the ice at the black store but purchased the identical brand from the white-owned store. He said, I don't like Mr. Brown's ice. It's too lumpy. Jack's Liquor's ice is better. That day, I learned that not only was white ice colder, but apparently smoother, at least to one black man. That's funny. Uh, inappropriate behavior has become deeply rooted in the psyche of black America's dialect type of reasoning. If whites touch it, make it, sell it, repair it, or talk about it, only then is it acceptable to Blacks. But on an even deeper level, Black inappropriate behavior seems to suggest that a significant number of Blacks place more value on being alive than the conditions under which they live. Eradicating these self-deprecating habits and learned behavior, uh, learned, learned inappropriate behavior patterns begins with offering Black people new information, new political and economic goals, new social psychological models, and new hope. So ultimately, if you want to know what my goal is, my goal is to um, offer a different perspective. Right. Why is my why do I feel like I have to make sure our perspective shifts away from what we've tried in the past? Um, it's because we know that the other stuff isn't working. Right? We know it's not working. We know we're not moving forward. So um, 
you know, if there are 100 people talking, you got to say something different from the other 99. You know, I, I, I just, you know, have thought about it. And I thought about all the things that I was told, you know, there were the keys to black success. And I said, this is not going to get us anywhere. And that last piece that he mentioned about the white man's ice being colder, we see this every day. Um, I know that um, for a long time, I did a lot of appearances on outlets like CNN and NBC and CBS and, and ESPN and all that stuff. And I stopped doing that stuff. I don't do that stuff anymore. Very, you know, it's very rare that I do any media stuff. Um, and um, and and the reason I did it, that stuff was because I knew that there were certain black people who would only believe I was legitimate if I was validated by these white media outlets. You know, there are black people that still to this day respect me more because I taught at Syracuse University and the Ohio State University than they would if I had been teaching, you know, with black people or just been running the black business school the entire time. There are black people who believe that Barack Obama is one of the most successful black people in America, even though there's a strong argument to say that he didn't do a whole lot or that there are black people who've done more for black people, right? Or why do they believe him to be one of the most successful black men in America? Well, because he was validated by white people. White people put him in the White House. If Barack Obama had said, screw the White House, I don't wanna be in the White House. I wanna go to the black house. I want to go and I want to work in the hoods of Chicago. I want to work with black kids on the streets. I want to help black families. Barack Obama wouldn't get the same respect from black people that he gets by being president of the United States, sitting in the same seat that Donald Trump uh, is sitting in right now. Right. And so basically um, that whole idea of the white man's ice being colder, uh, a lot of black business owners go through that. Um, I know that in the black business school, uh, you know, I have, you know, we bring in PhDs who taught at big white universities and have the same credentials as white people. Uh, but it's funny, like people will complain because we have a class that's like literally three or four dollars a day. But they these very same people went to a white university with inferior scholars, uh, with racist scholars, and literally paid them one hundred thousand dollars and felt that they were honored, felt it was an honor to give them one hundred thousand dollars right? And honor, right? And so ultimately, you know, I think all of us are affected by this. Um, I've been hit by that brainwashing too. I mean, we've all gone through that, right? And I think that we've got to shift that a little bit. You know, we got to kind of get into this idea. I mean, honestly, I, I think that there's some valid validity to people that even buy into a superiority complex. Uh, there's a lady who had this uh, book, um, uh, the wrote a book called The Hymn of the Tiger Mom. And she also wrote another book about cultures that where the, the people tend to succeed the most. Uh, and he, she said, Nigerian culture is, uh, according to her, the strongest culture. Because one of the things that they have is an inferior, a, a superiority complex. They really believe that if you are Nigerian, you're just better than everybody else. You know, not every Nigerian thinks this way, but a lot of Nigerians, she said, at least in her observation, she said, Nigerians, they just know that they're the shit. They just believe that. And that superiority complex allows them to say, why would I want to be around somebody else when I can be around other Nigerians? I mean, I'll only be around other people if I can't be around my own. Right. Uh, uh, two other factors that she mentioned in terms of cultural strength were um, uh, delayed the ability to delay gratification, which which African Americans really struggle with that too, right? We're trained on instant gratification. All the media that we're fed, uh, all the you know that our children are fed is all about instant gratification. That's why it's so hard to teach investing to Black folks because everybody wants to get rich quick. Everybody wants to get that money bag and go spend it now. Everybody's watching these TV shows that feed into this idea that you get that money, you get it fast, no matter what. You do the Cardi B model, go twerk it on a pole and, and make it rain hundred dollar bills, and you go to the mall and buy you a Gucci bag and all that. So instant gratification is pretty huge you know because that's the brainwashing uh, but they said the opposite is what builds a strong culture it's the ability to delay gratification and then the other area um and this is another area where slave thinking is the exact opposite of this is uh a, she said a commitment to educational excellence she said if you have a culture that's that's committed to educational excellence uh has the ability to delay gratification and has a sense of cultural superiority they're going to dominate other people. Uh, black people as a collective in America, at least, uh, do not have a strong commitment to educational excellence. We have a strong commitment to entertainment excellence. We have a strong commitment to um, sports excellence, right? Uh, and that's why Diddy, you know, will put, you know, he had a picture of Cardi B with her husband Offset and she and he put black excellence under that picture like that was the hashtag that's what a lot of people really perceive to be black excellence is a bunch of you know ignorant destruct self-destructive genocidal negroes dressed in fancy robes right we see that like that's 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 literally 
a, I think, a, 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 almost like a, a microcosm. It's like a, a perfect example of the dysfunctional view that we have of what it means to be black and excellent. It's, it's, it's Cardi B with her husband. He's wearing a ring on every finger, diamonds and stuff in his teeth, you know, ignorant as hell, mumble rapping his way to success, but he, but he's shining, you know, he's got the fancy car, uh, you know, maybe they're hooked on drugs, you know, whatever, like just getting into all kinds of things that are very unhealthy, very self-destructive, destroying the community, feeding ignorance to black people, teaching little girls that the way to get money is uh, is to go and, 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 you know, take care of a man in the bedroom. And that's how you get a new Gucci bag. Right. If you listen to the lyrics, I mean, I'm not dissing Cardi B at all on this. Maybe I am. Maybe I guess maybe I am. I'm not dissing her. I'm dissing the culture that 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 elevates something like that right um but but if you listen to the lyrics and i analyze rappers lyrics because i go on you know i've been on a lot of shows like the breakfast club so i like to know what the rappers are saying if you analyze those lyrics you're hearing a lot of messages that are not healthy for young black children but at the same time millions of little black girls are looking up to this right so you're feeding this to your kids so you can't feed poison to a community and expect that community to rise people who eat poison are not healthy people People, it's like somebody who eats chocolate cake all day long, every day is not going to be a great athlete. So what I think has to happen is you got to kind of let some of that go, right? This idea of saving all black people from all white media is kind of a long shot. I don't know if I have what it takes to do that. Maybe if I can get a, you know, maybe I can get a, a Floyd Mayweather type person or a bunch of athletes and entertainers to give me $20 million, then I can implement an agenda that would actually shift all of this. But that day hasn't occurred. Uh, we only have what we have, but I do believe that you can act, that there's a different model that can help us rise above that. And the model is a family specific model as opposed to the whole community. So, it, you know, while you can't make the whole black community committed to educational excellence, committed to delayed gratification, committed to uh, seeing themselves in a superior fashion uh, or whatever it is, you can do that in your own household. You can, you can certainly implement that in your household. That's where the whole um, Black Dragon concept came from with our Black Dragon families in the Black Business School, where I said, you know, think of your family as, uh, as, as, as a country and you are the government, you know, and it's not, you know, it's not a democracy, it's a dictatorship. So you are the government in this dictatorship and you decide what the policy, what the government policy is gonna be when it comes to you and your kids. So, uh, so you can implement policies that promote educational excellence. It's very easy to do, very basic, very simple. Uh, you just have the, your kids doing lots of reading, lots of writing, lots of math, and have them learn Black history, learn uh, how to start a business and how to build wealth, and then also maybe some uh, work on critical thinking skills. Just have them, you know, talk to them about life and Blackness and how to be an asset to the community, things like that. That's all education is. So uh, basically, educational excellence uh, might mean uh, putting your child in, in, in a special tutoring program after school or joining a homeschool cooperative where, um, you know, you push the child to the highest level that they can actually go, uh, making sure that, you know, that you aim for A's in every class instead of just B's and C's or just getting by, knowing that education is more important than sports, knowing that smart black people are strong black people, that uneducated black people are weak, right, or that people that walk away from education are the ones that are going to suffer the most. I think uh, a real strong commitment to educational excellence will goes a really long way. Um, in my experience, what helped me a lot was when I got to college and I, real, I, I decided to just study four or five hours a day. And, uh, and what that did was that pulled me way ahead of everyone else. I had the highest grade point average of many black students on campus and I would make A's on every test and it wasn't even hard because I set a high standard for myself. I raised my bar and because my bar was higher than everyone else, I had rewards and benefits that exceeded everyone else. I had insights that exceeded everyone else. I'm not, I don't just pretend to be a very smart black man. I am a very smart black man. I own that because I, I'm thinking and reading and analyzing all day, every day, all the time. And I've been doing that for 20 some years. Why wouldn't I be uh, a pretty smart black man, right? And so, um, so educational excellence, I think, should be like that number one priority. Uh, it's definitely more important than sports and everything else. All that stuff doesn't really add value to the black community, but intellect, smart people, people that know how to work together, people that know how to build, that's what's going to make the community strong. Second area um, was related to delayed gratification. That pretty much comes back to investing, the ability to invest, the ability to uh, make a sacrifice today so you can have a benefit tomorrow. That's all investing is. It's, 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 it's passing up 
BS now so you can get the good stuff later on, right? So uh, it, the delayed gratification might mean, uh, for example, young boys learning sexual discipline. Uh, a lot of young men destroy their futures because they can't control their penises. They they meet a pretty girl, they go, they is hit it and quit it. They're having sex with everything that moves. Next thing you know, they got babies, mamas, diseases, and a whole host of problems. Uh, you know, maybe it, it, it can even get worse, like a false accusation. I mean, if you have sex with 100 women, you're going to run into at least a couple crazy ones, right? Uh, you know, and then the next thing you know, everything you built is ruined because somebody's mad at you and she comes on your job and, uh, lie, you know, make something up or attacks you or whatever, right? And so the ability to, to, uh, to delay gratification and the ability to show sexual discipline is incredibly important for men, especially, but for women too. Women have to be able to show discipline, too, because remember, when men are running around getting in with every girl that they see, well, they, there are girls participating in this. There are women that are that are sleeping with men that they know are not good for them. They're giving themselves up and, and ruining their own futures by getting impregnated by guys who would be horrible fathers, you know, but they like him because he got swag and he got a beard and has alligator shoes or whatever it is, something silly like that. Right. Um, so so little things like that, the ability to delay gratification is huge. I mean, it is so huge. Uh, and when I was in school, um, you know, I remember that, you know, I did I was very different from my my friends. I didn't become successful by accident. I was different from my friends because I sat in school for as long as I needed to to get the highest level of education that I could. I studied longer than everybody else. I was you know, doing things other 26 year olds were not doing. Uh, I didn't care what the trend was. I didn't care what was cool. I didn't care what was in style. I didn't care about all that. I was like, man, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get out here and get ahead. I'm trying to have some muscle in my life. And, um, and, and that is really kind of, I think the attitude, you know, you have to have where you just say, I'm going to invest, invest, invest. If I get free time, I'm invested in a book. If I get some money, I'm going to invest that in a stock. If I, if I, if I want to get ahead, I'm going to invest that time in learning you know, business or economics or learning about love and relationships, whatever it is that you want to learn, like investing in knowledge, like that's really big. That links to delayed gratification. All investing really is, is delayed gratification. It's like, instead of spending the dollar, now I'm going to invest it so I can have more dollars to spend later. That's all it really is. It's like, I'm putting something aside now and delaying my gratification so that maybe now I will get uh, two ounces of gratification if I use it now. But if I wait, I can get 10 ounces of gratification. Like, like those people that plan for the future before the future actually arrives are the people who control the future. Right. The people who control 2018 are the people who were planning for 2018 back in 2009. They were thinking about 2018 back in 2002 when everybody else was caught up in what was going on in 2002. So that what that tiger mom says about delayed gratification is huge. It is so huge. If you have three kids and, and one of your children can delay gratification, the other two can't. That kid that can delay gratification is going to be your, your most successful child, period. Uh, so the third piece. Um, you know, a sense of superiority, a sense of pride. I like that a lot. You know, I think that, uh, you know, kids should be taught that being black is the best thing you could ever be. Being black means you're special. Be melanin is magic. Uh, melanin is a superpower. You are greater. You're like the Incredible Hulk, Iron Man and Thor. You know, I think that if you if we can convince ourselves of that, I mean, to the absolute core, that being around black people is better than being around anybody else. Uh, working with black people is better than working with anybody else. Uh, you know, marrying a black woman is the greatest blessing that a man could ever have. You know, being black, it just means that you were just kissed by God. Like, you know, that being black means you're going to be smarter, stronger, faster, more capable than anybody else. That, that black ain't just beautiful. Black is bold and black is bad as hell. Black is unstoppable. Like if you kind of put that in kids early, like I, I think that that just makes them such great assets to the community because they're excited about ways that they can contribute to this beautiful thing called blackness. They're not running away from it. They're running toward it because it's almost like, you know, why would I run away from something so wonderful and so amazing that actually gives me superpowers? So um, those three things are the three criteria that she mentioned for a really strong, successful culture. You can create a culture in your house. Um, it doesn't matter what everybody else does. One of the reasons that me and my sister and my brother were more, more successful than a lot of our friends, because remember, I told you guys I was born in the projects and and I had a lot of friends that ended up on drugs or dead or in prison. Um, uh, the reason that my, my parents' kids ended up different from other people's kids, even my own cousins, is because we had a unique culture in our household. Our parents' attitude was we don't care what so-and-so is doing down the street. We don't care what cousin blah, blah, blah did or, or we don't care what your friend's mama said when he got caught um, stealing the cookie out of the cookie jar or whatever. This is how things are going to happen in this house. 
And because we had a different culture in the house, we had different outcomes. So look at your house, look at the culture, change the culture and make it, make it, in, make your children and make your family into what you want it to be. All right. I'm about to go um, do this for me. Um, if you are interested in uh, enrolling your kids in, in one of our, in our black business school for children, um, our new entrepreneurship program is at blackceofactory.com. That's black ceofactory.com uh the program 75 percent off for the month of december and also your child can get a degree from the black business school during their time off uh additionally there are self-study exams and animated videos that teach your child everything they need to know about being an entrepreneur um i think it's a great program i think it's something that you're going to love also there's a 100 percent money back guarantee for the first 30 days if you're not happy for any reason whatsoever but you're going to be happy you're going to love it and the degree is important for building your child's self-esteem. You know, when your child gets a, you know, a degree, a, you know, something that is equivalent to a college degree or feels like a college degree at the age of 11, that's going to shape how they see themselves. You know, and I think it's real. I know it would have made a big difference for me. Um, it would have changed my whole trajectory. I wouldn't have wasted so much time doing other stuff. I would have actually went into business at the age of 10, 12, 13 years old. And I've seen little kids 12, 13 years old making thousands of dollars. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but the um, there was a kid. A seven-year-old kid who's, who made $22 million on YouTube this year. Seven-year-old kid, $22 million. Uh, now, that's hard to do. $22 million is a lot of money on YouTube. But there are lots of YouTubers um, who are making 100000 a year. You know, lots of, I'm talking about eight years, eight year old kids, you know, so, um, you know, get your kids thinking about business early and get them thinking about the quick and fast and strong ways to make money as opposed to the slow, stodgy, difficult ways. Like, OK, I'm going to go and go to college for 100 years and apply for a million jobs and go work for some crappy boss who's going to underpay me until I'm 40 years old and maybe one day I'll do better. Instead, teach them uh, ways to spot opportunities and ways to build institutions. And not only are you helping the community, but you're helping your family immensely. And you're also contributing significantly to the well-being of your child. So one of the ways black people are going to make a power move, this is how we're going to win the game, is that we're going to start sending our children to college at the age of seven. Uh, when we do that, uh, we've got college professors in the black business school. When you send your child to college at the age of seven, the age of eight, they have a 15 year head start on the white kids that they're going to be sitting next to when they go to Stanford or Yale or whatever. Also, they're not going to get sucked into all this nonsense that's being taught at these schools where they're being brainwashed. Um, they're going to already know who they are. So make sure they know who they are so that when somebody approaches them with BS and nonsense, they can say, that's not really for me. That's not what I was raised with. Uh, because remember that that sense of superiority, I think, is really important in terms of them saying I reject everything else because I'm 100 percent black and I'm not going to apologize for that for anybody. So, again, you can check out the entrepreneurship program for kids at blackceofactory.com. That's blackceofactory.com. So I'm out of here. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, Stace, that you were just able to get in here. Stacy looks like Stacy Gray. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hit you guys up again very soon. We'll have another session, another conversation. So um, we talked a little bit longer than usual, but I hope it was worth it. Um, I know I loved it and uh, I just let I just let it flow. And this ain't really me talking. This is this is a higher power. This is God or something or whatever you want to call it, um, fighting, flowing through me. So sometimes I'll say, well, gosh, I only plan to talk for 20 minutes, but I end up talking for an hour and a half. Well, that's because literally the, the stream of consciousness is coming out. And I want to share this with you before we all get old and gray and dead. So I'm literally talking, maybe some of you, I'm even talking to you from the grave. Maybe by the time you see this video, you know, I, I've been dead for 20 years, but I'm literally talking for the next two, 300 years for black people. And I believe that we can do this. I believe that if we put our energy together and we focus, I believe we can be the greatest people on this planet. I know that we already are. So take care, guys. I'll see you soon. Have a great day. Be good.